Previously, we've talked about a couple of sections of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Uh, we talked about the way that Jesus elevated the law of Moses. The law of Moses dealt with action. Jesus deals with attitude. Get the attitude correct. You won't make the mistakes of those wrong kind of actions. Six times in, in chapter 5, he says, you've heard that it was said, and then he quotes one of the Old Testament commandments and says, but I say. We talked about in the very end of chapter 7, after Jesus finishes, the people are astonished at his teaching. They've never heard anybody teach like this. And we noted at the very beginning of chapter 5 in those Beatitudes that Jesus is not dealing with a precept they've never heard. If they've heard these passages read out of the Old Testament, they've heard the precept, but it was never applied in the way that Jesus applies it to life. And that's what they find amazing. It's like the instructors in that Old Testament that were reading from it and talking about it in the synagogues in that first century didn't really apply it at all. Jesus does. But more than actually applying it, there's the way Jesus pieces it together. For example, in the Beatitudes, the very first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We talked about that poor being wretched and, and destitute and, and cowering away from humanity. It's a, it's a realization these individuals have of the problems in their life, not just physically, but spiritually as well, which really precipitates what happens in that next Beatitude. Blessed are those that mourn, for they should be comforted. It's like individuals that are grieving over the things that have gone wrong in their lives. So there's a remorse that they feel, but they can't have that remorse without the realization of where they actually are in life. The third thing that he mentioned is, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And again, in that process, approaching life's problems with an arrogant attitude will not really allow one to see solutions. So there's a humility that's got to be present. There's a kindness and a gentleness that's got to be present in the way that I approach that, that study of God's Word to find those answers. So now there's a recognition of a change in attitude precipitated by the remorse that I have for what I've done wrong, which comes about because I realize I've done things wrong in the first place. The fourth thing that he mentions, it's, it's in verse number six, of those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Well, now there's a resolve. It's a resolve to look for those answers, to search out everything I can find that deals with that particular problem so that that attitude can remain in place and the remorse can finally be assuaged. It can be, be taken away because there are some solutions for those atrocities that I've committed against God and against humanity. And the last one we mentioned, the last time we were together, was out of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. It was about those who are merciful, that they would obtain mercy. And again, an attitude that, that filters into all of these. If I am expecting to find solutions, if I'm getting rid of arrogance so I can actually search with a, a humble mind and a humble heart, recognize I do not have all the answers. If I am looking for mercy myself, I'm not going to be unmerciful to others. Should not be that way. The last three in the Beatitudes, beginning in verse number eight. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Where do I find that principle? Is that something that Jesus is enumerating from an Old Testament principle as well? And the answer is yes. In Psalm chapter 24, beginning in verse 3, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? Here's the answer. He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of our salvation. The pure in heart shall see God. This kind of uh, awareness of how I need to live my life, of, 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 of what I need to be, of, 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 of who I need to be, kind of filters into even the next one. The next one in verse 9 of Matthew 5 is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. They're the children of God. That purity of heart does not look, at, look for a malicious kind of ways to engage with others. Peacefulness is something that really is foremost on that individual's mind. Where do I find that? Psalm chapter 34, 
beginning with verse 11. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? And here's the answer. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Don't create problems. Solve them. Don't talk about them. Do something about them. Don't be angry about them. Don't be violent over them. Do something about it, but you can do something about it in a peaceable way. Blessed are the peacemakers. The last one seems like it's out of place, but it's not. The verse, verses 10 through 12, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now before we talk about the impact of this particular statement, where do I actually find that in God's word? I'm going to go to a different Old Testament book. Nehemiah, chapter 9. Verse 26, he talks about the nation being disobedient. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs, killed your prophets, and testified against them to turn them to yourself. They worked great provocations. They did everything against you and your prophets you could imagine. So when Jesus here in this particular passage in Matthew talks about blessed are you when people persecute you for righteousness sake. He's dealing with something that historically has happened all through history. So these last three, the, the pure in heart, he's dealing with, with who they are. Uh, the peacemakers, he's dealing with what they do. And those that are persecuted for righteousness sake, how they're treated. You think, well, does that really follow? Well, if, if, if there are individuals around that do not want solutions and you're trying to find some peaceful solutions, they'll do whatever they can to stop you. And they're not going to be peaceable about it when they do. They're not pure in heart. They're, they have a different kind of motive. There is either arrogance or selfishness or both. There's, there's a maliciousness about those individuals that do not want those problems solved. And those individuals that are endeavoring to do that, they will persecute as much as they possibly can. Sometimes it comes down to a message, a message they do not want to hear. And instead of engaging in that message and in, in dialogue, they will violently persecute the individuals with a different point of view, and they'll persecute them as severely as is possible. You know what that sounds like? It's been amazing to me as we've gone through these sections of Scripture that are on the daily Bible reading for our congregation. How many of these hit the problems of our current culture right on the head? These do too. Some of the individuals in our culture, they're living as though, number one, they've never heard of these Beatitudes, nor do they want anything to do with them. And individuals that are trying to solve problems or talk about problems and solutions and that seem to be geared in a different direction than what these individuals desire, they'll do anything they can to them to stop the message from being proclaimed. People have done that with Christianity for centuries. Unfortunately, it seems like they're going to be doing that to Christianity again. The Sermon on the Mount is an amazing, amazing, amazing discourse from Jesus, covering so many things in so many different ways. Hopefully you've read through it several times already since we began this, this look into those chapters. Please read it again when you have a chance. Please stay safe. We'll talk again soon.